Hello, that's working. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's, uh, it's good that everyone can be here, but um, so I'm not sure how to start this sermon, so I'm just going to get into it. Um, the sermon title is called My Father's Business. So before I open, I just want to say it's not necessarily the belief of everyone here, including Pastor Kevin, um, but I hope to provide some thought on what I believe the Bible actually teaches about this. And I hope that you will try every word that I say against the book, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, because that's the authority by which we preach, and it's not my opinion. So every, everything is compared to the Word of God. So I want you to compare my words to the Word of God. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Um, but I just want to speak about one thing, a couple of things today. Um, so I'll just start with, uh, in the world, so children are often known by their father's occupation. So even a lot of our Anglo names are remnants that we were known by a family occupation. So I looked up a, a study from familysearch.org about names, surnames derived from occupations in England in medieval times. Um, and it was used in the International Institute for Genealogical Studies in June 2012. And so just to give a slight overview of that, there's most of the, most of the trade surnames originated in medieval towns and villages and as each one had like a Carter, Haywood, Thatcher, Smith, Taylor, you can see where they actually get those names from. They're from occupations. Um, a Smith, a Taylor, a Thatcher, Haywood, Carter. Um, these were jobs that they held in the day. And the reason there are so many Smiths, you know, in, in Western nations is because there were, a Smith was just anyone who created something. So there's a lot of Smiths because you've got blacksmiths, shoesmiths, arrowsmiths, swordsmiths, goldsmiths, uh, greensmiths, whitesmiths. Six myths, and the people who make sickles for harvesting and things like that. So this is where a lot of people's names come from, is uh, due to what their ancestors actually did for a living, um, which is fascinating in itself. Um, but in the Bible, the emphasis is a little different. Men are often known by who their father was, um, like David, the son of Jesse, is often referred to as that, um, as well as you have... Um, geolocation like Paul of Tarsus. You know, he was known as Saul or Paul of Tarsus because that's where he was from. Um, so there are several ways to identify, identify somebody. And Jesus was also known as Jesus of Nazareth. Um, because that's where he grew up in Galilee to fulfill scripture that he would be called a Nazarene. Um, but also he's known as the son of God because that's who his father is. And so... I often hear people say that Jesus was a carpenter, but I can't for the life of me find that anywhere in Scripture. So that being said, these names are an introduction just to help us understand why somebody might call him the son of a carpenter or might call him a carpenter. But the only instances we have, and we'll go over those in a minute, are of other people saying that about him, but the narrator of the Bible doesn't say this, neither does Jesus himself. Uh, and I think that's pretty important. Um, as well as to whether he actually did any carpentry. Well, the Bible is completely silent on that. Um, so you can speculate on that, but we should never build doctrine on what the Bible doesn't say. Always build it on what it actually clearly states. So some people like to speculate about that. But I'm hoping to show today at least the Lord never considered himself or called himself a carpenter. He went out of his way every time to say that he's not Joseph's son, but he's from his father in heaven. So I want to preface the sermon with this, just a couple of statements about what I believe, because this, this, this sermon's going to cover some things and go very heavy in one direction, but it doesn't mean I don't believe other things as well, which can also be true. So I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was with God in the beginning. As the Son of God, he didn't become the Son of God at his birth, as some people will falsely teach. Um, but this sermon is going to emphasize Jesus' Father being God, the Father in heaven, um, how there's always been one God. These three, they have always been the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost from eternity past. They all, there are three persons. Um, nor am I denying the humanity of Christ because he was born of a woman. He was 100% man and 100% God. So, but that was through Mary and none of that was through Joseph. And that's what I hope to show. So we'll get into some scriptures. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. After that, uh, I'll get you to turn to Mark chapter 6. 
I mean, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. See, I think it's important to use the words the Bible and the Holy Ghost teaches and not the wisdom of man. Um, and uh, so you can make assumptions about whether or not Jesus was a carpenter, but I'd rather just let the Bible determine uh, what I believe based on clear statements. And I know this doesn't necessarily affect the church a lot. I know a lot of people in church don't believe that, but it's some of it's for me because I'm just really tired of hearing my Lord and Savior be reduced to just a carpenter from the Middle East 2,000 years ago. I think that's profane to talk about the Son of God in that way. Um, and nor am I saying there's anything wrong with carpentry. It's a skillful trade. But, um, you know, when we're talking about the Lord, we're talking about the Son of God, talking about the nature of God and who God is. You know, I think it's important to use the words that the, the Holy Ghost teaches on that matter. And so I don't worship, you know, a, a carpenter from the Middle East. I worship the living Son of God, Jesus Christ. Um, so if you turn to Mark chapter 6, verse 1, I'm going to read you. So this is one of the passages where the word carpenter comes up. There's only two times in the entire New Testament. Both are the same event. I'm going to read from Matthew 13, 53. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. When he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, insomuch as they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So you're there in Mark 6, and we're going to see the exact same thing happen, except this is Mark's account. In Mark 6, verse 1, it says, And he went out from thence, and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, in his own kin, in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. So these are the only two mentions of carpenter in the New Testament. And it says Jesus marveled at their unbelief. But what was their unbelief? So they're saying he's the son of Joseph. They're not saying he's the son of God. That was their unbelief. But uh, Jesus was about his father's business. See, they didn't recognize his authority as the son of God because they knew his family. They knew his brothers and sisters. So we know that Jesus is that prophet that Moses spoke of that should come. And he was preaching and teaching as one having authority, which is why they're saying, how can this guy do this? We know who his family is. Um, and yet he's able to preach like he has authority. But the unbelief... Uh, was in their hearts that they didn't believe his words or the power by which he preached and by saying is not this the carpenter or the carpenter's son so i believe they're trying to discredit him and what he's teaching so it's, it's like saying you know we know this guy he's joseph's son so here are his brothers and sisters that's why it says they were offended at him and because of their unbelief the lord didn't do many miracles there so they bring up joseph as his father and his half-brothers and sisters, so they share the same mother, which is Mary, but they do not share the same father. Jesus responds always being clear who his father is and who his brethren and his mother are. Um, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 12, 46, we'll just look at a small passage here. So in Matthew 12, 46, it says, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. So that's Mary and his step-siblings. 
Then one spoke unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them, unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. See, it's consistent with Christ being the Son of God, and all those that are of Christ are also born of the Father. See, Jesus came to be the first fruits among many brethren. In Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It's one of the reasons Christ came. And this is why we are his brethren. But notice he says you're his mother and his brethren, but you're not his father because he only has one father. And we too also only have one father. Matthew 23, 9 says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. See, Jesus reconciled us to the father through his sacrifice. Uh, if you want to turn to Matthew 10, we'll be there shortly. But I'll read through uh, Hebrews 9, verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctifieth through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Uh, purge your, sorry, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. This is the reconciliation that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, shed his blood for us. He reconciled us to the Father. He offered himself without spot so that we could have eternal life. And that's why as a new man, we're born of God. Talks about being born again. born again. See, the old man, the flesh, is dead. He's crucified with Christ on that cross. But the new resurrected man is born of God, which makes us sons of God. And that makes God our father. And that's why we can be called the sons of God. It says, To, him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you're there in Matthew 10. Look at verse 34. This is another aspect of that too. Matthew 10, 34 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall they be of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. See, in Revelation it says they love not their lives unto death. But why is that? Because they love the Father more than their own lives. And as Jesus pointed out here, more important than your mother and father on earth is your Father in heaven. And he always comes first. And now that is going to put some friction in your relationships on this earth because the Lord is always going to come first. But there are also commandments that God has to protect this as well, that you should love your wife and reverence your husband as unto the Lord. Because if you love the Lord and if you put the Father first, you'll love your wife, you'll love your, reverence your husband. And children as well, they've got a commandment to obey your mother and father, which if you love the Father in heaven you're going to obey that commandment to love your earthly mother and father as well and to obey them. Because Jesus obeyed his parents. We'll get to that in a second. But First John 2.22, it says, Who is a liar that he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let, therefore, let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So I'm not saying that anyone who says Jesus was a carpenter or a carpenter's son is antichrist. That's not what I'm saying. 
that I'm not saying they're denying the Father and the Son, because I've heard this all my life in churches growing up, and I believe it's just from like Sunday school materials, that kind of thing, maybe the Catholic Church, bad doctrine from there. I don't know where it came from, but I really don't like it as a doctrine. Uh, because the Bible just makes vague mention of it, but people like to run with, with doctrines, um, even with just a vague mention. And I believe it's something that's just repeated without verification, which most bad doctrine is. But I think it also, while it seems harmless, can also be more nefarious. Because there are some men who do deny that Jesus is the Son of God. And they will mock you by saying that you worship a carpenter from 2,000 years ago. And they are antichrists who deny the Father and the Son. John 8.40 but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. He's speaking to the Jews here. Ye do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. But Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So again, we've got two records, or re really one record, of Jesus being referred to as a carpenter or a carpenter's son. But how many times is he called Jesus the Christ or Messiah in Scripture? What does the Bible emphasize? So just the word Messiah or Christ, 571 mentions in the New Testament. Wouldn't surprise anybody here who's read the New Testament. And the phrase son of God is mentioned 47 times. That's let alone all the other times he's mentioned as, you know, the son or the father. You know, there's so, there's so much emphasis on Jesus and who his father is. Just in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. At the end of verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He doesn't say the father of Jesus, it says the husband of Mary. Because the Bible is very clear about never calling Joseph his father. Not one time. And he's called Jesus Christ because that's who he is. So he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Lord of the Old Covenant and the author of the New Testament. We could, uh, I won't get you to turn there because we all know Acts 8.34. It's the Ethiopian eunuch. It said, and the, answer, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom seeketh this prophet, of himself or some other man. And Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. The eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what if he answered, I believe that Jesus is the son of Joseph the carpenter? That's not who he is. What Peter taught him is what we see him answer with. He answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. So is our Lord the son of a carpenter? Was it a carpenter that died on the cross for your sins? Or was it the Lord, the Son of God, God himself manifest in the flesh, who shed his own blood for you? Because it's important to understand. It's God who died on that cross. It's God who shed his own blood for us. And God emphasizes that so much through the New Testament. So if you want to turn to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 29. So this is talking about uh, John the Baptist uh, in, in John 1, 29. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom, it is said, of whom I said, After me cometh the man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not but that it should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit sending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So we see Joseph was not his father except on paper. He was the husband of Mary. And when it says in Mark in the genealogy, it says uh, Joseph as was supposed the father. It makes very clear because Joseph had no DNA with the Lord. 
See, the makeup of Jesus is Mary and God the Father in heaven. That's his humanity and that's his deity. He's 100% man, 100% God. So the Holy Ghost came upon her and she was with child, but he had no earthly father. So among people, it was supposed that Joseph was his father, but it was generally along those, among those who did not believe he was the Christ, as we saw before. And we believe in the virgin birth. Uh, in Matthew 1.18, we see that story. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, so they haven't even consummated their marriage, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. And he was right to do that. That was all within the law of God. But why would he put her away? Because they haven't consummated the marriage, and yet she's pregnant. So you can believe that she cheated on him. But of course, the angel then comes and straightens it out and says, no, what, what she's got, what she's carrying is of the Holy Ghost. In Matthew one twenty. It says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son. Thou shalt name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So again, Joseph played no part in that whatsoever. It was purely just the, the Holy Ghost came upon Mary, and Jesus was conceived that way. It's where his humanity and his deity comes from. And see, Jesus was a preacher. So he was a preacher going about his father's business. And Jesus stresses what his occupation and identity was on this earth. And we see that so many times. He is known as Jesus the Christ, which is, you know, being translated means the Messiah, is how the Bible translates that, that word. He's the Son of God, He's the Savior. And that's where my salvation lies, that's where my hope is in believing in the name of the Son of God. And even as a child, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 46, we still see Jesus as a child being about his father's business. See, he set the example that the heavenly father always comes first and we should always do that which is pleasing to him. So we see in Luke 2, 46, this is when Jesus has gone off the synagogue to preach while his family traveled on without him. And after a couple of days, they looked, and he was gone. So in Luke 2, 46, it says, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Thus dealt with us. Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, how is it you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? As that, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus isn't running off to go to a carpentry convention. He was about his father's business at the house of worship. He was reading the scriptures, expounding them about himself and why he came to this earth. And uh, he even rebukes them, saying, Thy father Joseph and mother Mary have sought thee. His father knows exactly where he is. And he rebukes them for that. They didn't understand at the time, but he's doing the work his father sent him to do. And as I said before, I'm not saying he didn't obey Mary and Joseph. They were his guardians on this earth. And Jesus did keep all the commandments, including the commandment to honour thy father and mother. But we saw there in Luke 2.51, uh, 2, it said he was subject unto them. So the Lord was subject unto his guardians on this earth, but he was always about his father's business, and he always prioritised that. And I just think it's important to emphasise what the Bible emphasises and not what it doesn't. See, I don't know about you, but I want to know the truth about my Lord and Saviour. I think that's incredibly important. If I'm expected to die for the word of God, then you better have the right Lord. You better be following the word of God, you know, which is the Lord. Um, I'll get you to turn to Revelation 19. Pastor preached on this recently, but I'll read to you from Revelation 6, 9. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Again, you want to make sure you're holding the right testimony if you're going to put your life on the line for the Lord. Revelations 12.10 And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So, you know, who would you die for to the point where you just don't regard your own life? You know, for me, it's basically the Lord. Like that's, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd die for a lot of people, but for the Lord, like that's, that's something that we should do. We should be willing to die for the Lord because he died for us and he purchased us. I'll get to that a little bit later. But you're there in Revelation 19, verse 11. It said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So... If we're going to lay down our life, it's going to be for the Lord. It's going to be for the Son of God who laid down his life for me. And that's a testimony that I hold. But if he's the son of a carpenter from Galilee, then why would you die for him? Why would you lay down your life for him? Because I know I wouldn't. But Jesus is God. It was the blood of God that was shed for me. He purchased this vessel with his own blood. And that's why my life is his to do as he sees fit. So I think I've established that Jesus' Father is the Heavenly Father. Um, at least I hope so from here. So from here on, I just want to look at the question, what is our Father's business? So if you want to turn to Luke chapter 4, it's not going to cover all, everything he was sent to do, because there was way too, like the entire New Testament covers everything he was sent to do. Um, and we're not going to get through all of that. There's just way too much. But we are going to see a few things here, a few points of what he was sent to do. So in Luke 4, 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Again, he's about his father's business. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty them which are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And all, the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So this is just a small list of some of the things the Lord was sent to do here on earth. So we see the preaching of the gospel to the poor. Obviously, you've had a great time doing that the last couple of weeks over in the Philippines and what a receptive area it seemed to be. But um, healing the sick, brokenhearted, preaching deliverance to the captives and setting them at liberty. And we know that where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So again, it came to remove the bondage of sin because that's what salvation does. See, we have the new man that we can walk. We can walk in the new man and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's a gift he's given to us. So we, we don't have to be under the bondage of sin. But also he's given us eternal life and forgiveness of sins, knowing we'll never face the consequences of our sins in hell. That's another bondage that is removed from us. Overcoming death and the ability to overcome sin. And this is our Father's business. This is what he sent his son to do. And uh, it's also why we're to show to others that they can have the same thing. In John 4.25, um, you're welcome to turn there. We've got a few verses there. John 4.25, this is the, So the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? 
The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? And the testimonies we had this morning from, uh, from Corey and, and Pastor about how people didn't care when they heard the gospel and believed it, they didn't care about themselves. They're like, I need to share this with everyone I know. This is the exact same thing. She goes, I've got to share this with everyone I know. This is the Christ. Many understood that this was the work of the Lord. When he preached to them, many believed and couldn't even help but spread the news that the Messiah had come to take away their sins. John 4.30 continues on. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? But Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. See, the work of God is to preach the gospel of Christ. Christ himself, he taught the kingdom of heaven and of God. And he said, my meat's to do the will of him that sent me. Obviously speaking about the Father. And to finish the work the Father sent him to do. See, he had to die on the cross. He had to pay, pay for the sins of all mankind through his death, burial and resurrection. And he had to bring liberty to those held captive by sin, to bring life to those who were dead in trespasses and sins. In John 4, 39, there's that many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And he said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And again, just what a great testimony. But another reason why he came, as was mentioned there, was healing the sick. So in John 5:14, it says, Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. Well, the bad news for them is Jesus is equal with God. Jesus is the Son of God, and he is God. But they didn't believe that, and that was to their own damnation. And there are many miracles of Christ go through the New Testament, especially the book of Mark. You'll see demons being cast out. So many good miracles. Book of Acts as well. Healing the sick, casting out devils, which are some of the works. But nothing angered the unbelievers more than doing those things on the Sabbath day because they didn't understand the law and the purpose for the law. Um, John 6, 28 says, They said unto him, What shall we do that we, we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him on whom he hath sent. So the first work of God is all men must do is believe on Christ. Now, believing isn't a work in the traditional sense. It's an act of faith, as we all understand. But Jesus is playing word games with them because they've asked what works they should do. So every time Jesus teaches clearly the reason the Father sent the Son and how he always does that which the Father has given him to do, John 6, verse 30. Said They said, Therefore unto him, What signs showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not their bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And then said they unto him, Evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye have also seen me, and believe not. See, it's so important that those who hear these words believe on Christ. If you want everlasting life, that meat and drink, which you eat once and it satisfies you forever, that's salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is that bread of life. 
He's that water of life. And he came to be the first fruits of the resurrection so we can have eternal life. And uh, again, it says that was given by the Father. Just consistent with the rest of the New Testament, and the rest of Scripture. But it does continue further as well in John 6.37 about how he'll never lose anyone who believes on him. That's our eternal security. John 6.37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What a promise. That promise is for us. But this is the wonderful work that the Father sent the Son to do for us. It just says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, and no man is able to pluck us out of his hand. No one can pluck us out of the Father's hand, and that's our eternal security. So we know no matter what, we're children of God and we belong to him, and we have a Father in heaven. So another one of the works he was sent to do, of course, was to die on the cross and fulfill Scripture. So John 17, 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know that the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So Jesus spent his entire life doing the work the Father sent him to do. And he was an example for us, because the Father also has works that we're to do. So we all know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So salvation is a free gift, not to be confused. But there are works the Father has given us to do also because he's purchased this vessel. He's purchased our bodies through his own blood. And so, you know, we're expected to work for him because he has works for us to do. Now, we get rewarded for that because God doesn't want us to ever think that we're working our way to heaven. So everything after salvation, there's, you know, he pays for it. Like he rewards us. He pays our wage because when we work, he pays for it. He makes sure there's no mistaking the free gift. Um, he's very clear about that. But also we, like Jesus, should put you know, those works first as well. We should love in word and deed. And another work of the Lord we saw there was to glorify the Father and to manifest his name on the earth. So he's got to teach us of the triune nature of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's why there's not a lot of that in the Old Testament. But the New Testament just is so clear about the triune nature of God, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, these three are one. You've got one God, three persons, and they're distinct persons. In John 17, 5, it says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Again, we see the Son was with the Father eternally, in eternity past. It said, I have manifested thy name under the men, which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have not known all things whatsoever thou hast given me or of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So again, Jesus doesn't emphasize himself. He always makes it clear he was sent by the Father to do these things. And he manifested his name among the earth. And I just love that every time Jesus speaks of glory, he points to the Father that the Father would be glorified. And just like we're given this treasure in earthen vessels, where the glory is of God and not of us. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of the Messiah. He also fulfilled all the necessary steps for our salvation perfectly. And his reward is that all things were put under him and all glory is given unto him except for the Father who is always over him. But these are some of the uh, scriptures that he fulfilled. John 19, 
23, so then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam and woven from top throughout. They said, therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was a set of vinegar, a, was set a, vi a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it in, upon hyssop, put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So we see a lot of fulfillment of Christ's work up to that point, but there's still more to do. See, there are further prophecies that have to be fulfilled, as well as further things the Lord does in order to secure our salvation. But John 19, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, it was a holiday, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first, and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was dead already. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there our blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, thou shalt look on him whom they pierced. So again, even after his death, there is still fulfillment of scriptures and prophecies. And they were all fulfilled in Christ. But his work up until that point had been completed. That was his life. That was the teaching, the preaching, declaring the Father unto us so that we can understand who he is. And also standing before the judgment of, um, of the Roman government and being beaten and crucified. So he'd accomplished all of that. But he also had to be buried in the tomb and go to hell for three days and three nights. Um, and his resurrection occurring after that because... He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And he was speaking of his resurrected body. He also had to sprinkle his own blood on the mercy seat in heaven, which speaks of our salvation. So all of this had to come to pass. It's also the works that were given to him of the Father. But a lot of that was done outside of the view of men. But the Bible does tell us about it. Of course, in Hebrews, one of the, one of the best uh, ways to find the explanation of of bringing the old covenant into the new covenant and what Jesus fulfilled in that. Hebrews 12, 24 says, And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hebrews 9, 21. Moreover, he sprinkled with both blood the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. This is talking about uh, Moses. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified of these. The patterns was what Moses did. Um, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, and this is what the Lord did. So those, those things in the old covenant sacrifices were a picture of what Christ was going to do for us to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat. And that compares the blood of bulls and goats, which can't take away sins, with the precious blood of Christ, which he shed for us at his death. And those things were just a picture of what he would do in those heavenly places. In Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, again talking about Moses and the tabernacle, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as a high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And the Bible's always clear. It's God who manifests himself in the flesh, and it's God's blood who was shed. It's God who died on the cross and was resurrected again for us. It was the Son of God who is eternal who did these things. It's consistent. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. So the Father's business for both Christ and ourselves 
we'll see as well, is to be the light of the world. So if you want to turn to John chapter 9, we'll start in verse number 1. So John chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. But as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And see, now that Christ is gone, we're the light of the world. So Luke 11.33 No man who has lighted a candle putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye, therefore when thine, body is, when thine eye is single, the whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed therefore that the light which be in thee be not darkness. For if thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. See, Jesus was that bright shining candle when he was on the earth. But now we're that bright shining candle. He left the disciples in his day to be that light, and we are that light. And we're to display it proudly and not hide it from the world. See, we're the way of salvation for this world. We preach the works of Christ and we preach his death, burial, resurrection. And that's why we're the light of this world. Uh, John eight twelve, Then Jesus spake uh, again, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Mm-hmm. So Jesus came to bear witness of the Father and himself. In John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and, grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And Jesus speaks about how, in John 8, how he didn't come to bear witness of himself, but the Father also bears him witness. Um, because we know in the, in the mouth of two or more witnesses, a matter shall be established. But in John 8, 24, he said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. But the reason they can't go with him is they didn't believe he's the Christ, the Son of God. So they're not going to go to heaven to be with the Lord when he goes. They're wondering, why can't we go? Where's he going to go? It's like, you're not going because you don't believe. And Jesus always points back to his purpose. If you don't believe that I am here, you should have done your sins. Exodus 3.13 says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So you have to believe that he is the only way. There is one I am. There is one saviour, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's one Lord, one God, one Son of God, who shed his own blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat for us. John 8, 28 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Sorry, John 8, 26. I have many things to say and judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him. And he speaks of when you've lifted up the Son of Man, that's talking about his crucifixion, because he knew how he should die. And you should know that I am he when you see him die in this manner. You'll know that he's God, that he's the I am, that he is the Lord who guided Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. He was a cloud by day and a fire by night. And it's the Father that sent the Son to do the work of the Father by the Son. So we all, of course know the John twelve thirty two. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This said he, signifying what death he should die. So of course he was also sent to train the apostles, and to give us example of what what, what we should do afterward. 
in John 20, verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. So we don't need to confirm the words with signs as they did, because the word is confirmed. We have a more sure word of prophecy in the scriptures. But uh, the command is for us as for them. It said, as the Father sent me, well, I'm sending you. And that's a command for us as well. So we need to be about our Father's business. What's, what's his business? Preaching the gospel. Baptizing those who believe and teaching them all things the Lord has taught us which he heard from his Father in heaven and the things that we've heard from our Father in heaven through Scripture. There are other works as well which can be to establish the church. See, the church business is our Father's business. Jesus gave himself for the church. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See, and God honours the judgment of the church. It's an institution of authority that he established. And the pastor being the shepherd with Christ being over him, you know, that's the authority that he's established. Matthew 18, 18, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And this is specifically talking about church judgment, if you read the context. And if heaven accepts the judgment of the church, especially regarding church discipline, then we must also honour and respect that judgment of the church, just as, just as heaven does. So we've mentioned preaching the Bible, preaching the gospel, both very important works the Father has left us to do. Teaching and raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So beating them with the rod early, so you can drive the foolishness far from them and they won't depart from it. You need to give them the best chance they have. Um, so again, working as your job, working at your job is under the Lord. Doing your best for your employer as if you're working under Christ because Christ will reward you. If your boss doesn't reward you, it doesn't matter. The Lord will reward you. Uh, read the Bible and teach others what you learn from the Bible. Pray to the Lord for your family and your brethren, other works we can do. Serving the church, just in the best capacity you can, whatever you can do. Just do something for the church and serve the brethren. Because the Lord is very pleased when you do that. And this is how we as his children, being born of God, can be about our Father's business. And uh, there's a few verses in Matthew chapter 6, if you want to turn there. But Jesus, again, quite often in Matthew 6 especially, uses the term your father. So Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your father which is in heaven. Matthew 6, 4. Thine arms, that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Don't you want the Lord to reward you rather than the world? The Lord's going to give him far better rewards. Matthew 6.25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Of course we're better than they. That's the whole point of that, that scripture. The Lord takes better care of us than he does the birds, and yet they've got nothing to worry about. What have we got to worry about? Even less than that. That's why I believe it says, be careful for nothing. But we don't need to worry about those things because if he's going to provide it to the birds he created, he's going to give it to his children. He's not going to give you a stone if you ask for bread. He said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, Matthew 6.31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things that the Gentiles seek. And that's talking about unbelievers. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's about putting God first, putting our Father ahead of other things. 
and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Look, he's not going to say, oh, I know you put me first, but I'm not going to give you clothing and food. And, and he's promised, if you put those things first, you shall receive these things. But put the Father first. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. See, we have a loving Father. It's the same loving Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God. He cares for us. He provides for us. He hears our prayers and petitions. He answers our prayers. And we have to understand who our Father is. And we love him because he first loved us. And the way he showed he loved us is by sending his son to die for us. So we need to also keep the commandments in the new man and serve him all the days of our life, loving not our lives unto death. So I'll get you to turn to Galatians 4. That'll be the last place that I have you turn. I'll just read from John 4.23. It says, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. See, that's who my, that's who my Savior is. That's where my faith is. He's not the son of a carpenter. He's the son of my Father in heaven. He's the God. He is God and was with him in the beginning as the son of God. And I'm a son of the Father in heaven through Christ. And so is everyone who believes on the Lord. So Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And boy, do I love that promise. And this is who we are. And don't ever forget who you are. We're sons and daughters of our Father in heaven, and we're heirs of all the promises given to Abraham and to Christ. That's why it says in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in that time of need. See, who loves you more than a father that gave you life? Who's going to provide for you as his child? Who's going to discipline you when you do wrong? Who's going to show mercy upon you when you confess your sins? See, our Heavenly Father does all these things because he loves us, and we're born of him. So if we love him, we're going to be about our Father's business as he commanded us to do. And I think it's important that we understand who the Father is. And who the son is and i just want to please him by teaching what he teaches in the scriptures see he instructs me as a father through his word he's the one who teaches me right from wrong good and evil he's the one who sets that boundary of morality because the world has no morality and their morality is so opposite of what the bible teaches but I, he wants me also to understand his laws so that i can love what he loves and hate what he hates, and so that I can do what pleases him. So let's pray.